in the music business because of the challenge and because of need. I needed to work and not work for someone and so I invested in the music industry. How did you actually first begin production? I, my first release was Every Night by Joe White and Chuck and um, incidentally I got an award for this and um, I grew from strength to strength there. So you actually went around and linked up with all the musicians? And yes, yes. Um, tell us a little bit about that, that session, that first session. That first session I had Baba Brooks and I put him in charge of it and um, he did a splendid job. When they made the cut of every night, um, it was just one cut and I said, please don't do it over. Because I just felt it was right, you know? And it was a great success. And even today, I feel very proud when I speak of it. Um, can I just change the battery, Steve? I'm sorry. Let's move this around a little as well. What we'll talk about next is um, to, just to give you a little bit of time to mm -hmm. think. Those musicians, um, Baba Brooks, you know, even made the track called First mm -hmm. Session, which is mm -hmm. one of yours, and a whole series of records by Baba Brooks. Mm -hmm. And they have a slightly different sound. Yes. I mean, you were coming already with a, a, your own style there. Mm -hmm. um, just some, a few words about those musicians, who was in the band other than, than Baba Brooks. Um, you had Skakamba. Oh, sorry, Steve, one second. I'm not rolling. I'm rolling. If you could say in the band. In the band, you had Skakamba, Baba Brooks. Um, I'm looking at him, I can't remember much, most of them at the moment, but they, those musicians of that time, they were not just interested in the money. They were interested in the sound, they wanted to expose themselves so that you could know what kind of music they could play and they were just eager to do what was right. And it was a good mix then of producer and musicians because everybody was in a learning process and so the best was coming out of them at that time. In today's, um, at this stage, I think everybody thinks that they know it and so they're just doing it their way. But in those times we, we explored, we tried something, we would maybe use one roll of tape and, and just do jam sessions and out of that sometimes you go back, you can find something meaningful to go out on the road. Hence I came up with so many instrumentals. And um, I was one for drums. I liked drums. And it was a dream of mine that when I go to Africa, I would just tape drums and more drums and come back and work with it. Unfortunately, when I went, I never had the chance to. But um, I used what I could find, like um, Count Ozzy and um, some men from out of Portland. Uh, some of those have not been released. I have them on tape. I have a beautiful drum sound on tape that I made and I used um, Aubrey Adams to play jazz and Ernest Wrangling to play jazz on top of it. And it is wonderful. It has never been released. I call it Lulumba. <laughs> so, Leslie Butler and Jojo Bennett. Yes, were, were yes, they? all of those men. Oh. And um, this fellow from Trinidad, Lynn Tate. They were beautiful people to work with, you know. And you not being so knowledgeable on music, they would use their ideas and say to you, what do you think of that? And of course, you have the sound, you have a sound in your ear, an ear for a sound, but they would know musically what to put forward. And so we had a beautiful blend then. 
Lenny Hibber as well. Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. How did you How did you get to to, to uh, link up with him? Well, in those times, they themselves wanted to be exposed, the musicians, and so they were putting their best foot forward, and. Um, they maybe would play in nightclubs, but it wasn't the same as having it on record. And so I did quite a few instrumentals with Lenny and those musicians of yesteryear. Um, also, you were recording some of the leading groups at the time. The yes. Oh, yes. I've run that thing. Um, for example, the melodic. Yes. Let's talk first about the Melodians. How did they come to you? The Melodians, I think they were dissatisfied where they were. I don't know for what reason, but it was nearing Christmas and um, they came, wanted me to record them. I realized they needed some money for the holiday and I did two tunes, but they were not of the standard to go on the street. However, I gave them some money. And then after the Christmas, they came back and we had a wonderful session. And um, when we did like Little Nut Tree, I am looking at the time now, we did it in the middle of the night, a dynamic sounds. And Tony Brivet became very ill and was taken to the Bellevue Hospital from the studio after he had finished recording it. And while he was in there, he wrote a tune for me. In the, uh, the only thing I can say of artists of yesteryear, they were poor, but they were lovely people. They had love and they shared. And if you showed them kindness, they would give it back to you in return. I can't say too much for today's artists because I am not working with them. But in those times, they really were wonderful people to work with. And they would listen. They wanted to be upgraded. You could easily talk with an artist and say, now when you're going on stage, you should do so and do so. Groom your hair and that. They would listen, you know, and felt no, no way about it because they realized it was a growing process for them too. Taking up that point about um, stagecraft and mm -hmm. appearance and so mm -hmm. forth, um, you've been notably successful with female artists, starting out with Judy Moore. Yes. Could you tell us perhaps why, why you think that is? I suppose it's the maternal instinct that comes up there. And um, I think ladies should be treated in a certain way. I think ladies should have a certain deportment. I think ladies should sing on a certain vein and trend. And uh, so I did I'm Alone with Judy Mott first. That was the first tune I did with her. And it was a very crucial time in her life. And so I thought if I befriended her, it would make her stronger. And to this day, we are still friends. We may, may not see each other very often, but when we meet, we greet each other very well, and we look forward to the success of each artist, you know? But she did very well with that song. She has redone it, but it does not have the same feeling, you know? At that time, I suppose, it was coming from the gut of, of things, you know? And that is the time you get the true feeling out of an artist when they're singing from here and not the throat. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Marsha Griffiths, mm -hmm. another um, woman singer there that you brought to prominence. Tell us a bit. Well, Marsha is like my relation. Um, we do have a very good rapport with each other. I remember I was in New York and so was she and she called and she said, Miss P, you don't want to record me? And I said to her, I had been encouraging her that she could go solo. And I said to her, the first thing we would record is a lot of your hits that you have done as a duo. We would do it singly and make a good album. And so we came up with Naturally 
which is a classic. And um, then we went on to, we released Dreamland first from that album and that was a resounding success. And so because of the maternal instinct again it comes up that you become friends, you know, and they were girls of, they would listen, you know, they wanted to grow too. And so I suppose to some extent they emulated me because um, quite recently I heard Marcia on an interview and I felt very tall. She said she's from my stable and coming from my stable she had to be disciplined because that's what I stand for and I felt very tall about that. Um, going back to the 60s now, how would a producer, particularly a producer like yourself just starting out then in the mid-60s, how would a producer go about getting his or her music played on the radio in those days? <laughs> well, I would send it to the station. In those times, I suppose, like the sound systems, um, they want to be first. And so in those times they would cut a dub, what's called a dub, a dub plate, and you would send it and the announcer would, it would give him a thrill to be the first to air it, you see, and so it gives you a start there. And when it is recorded on record and labeled and everything, you send it in and that's it. If the music is good, they'll play it. They maybe not ride it, but they'll play it. But I had a program for 15 years that um, I had on the radio. And there's a little trick there that I did once, which I feel very proud about when I had Move Up, Jamaica Move Up. It was an independence tune, and I pulled a fast one. I had both radio stations at the same time doing the same program, the one tune playing it for 15 minutes each station and it was an outrage at the time but um, I think they made adjustments so that could not be done again so that was history. <laughs> um, of course the other area for which you're renowned is the recording of religious music. Tell us a bit about that, just Jamaican religious music in general some of your thoughts on that please. Well, I thought being from a religious family and brought up in a religious home, I thought that well we're doing songs for all sectors and I didn't hear anything happening for the people who were believers and so I said well I'm going to try gospel and so I, I tried gospel. I started and I recorded Otis Wright and there was a big, big hit that even the dance halls were playing it, which was Man of Galilee. So um, out of that, Reverend V.B. was born because I dubbed him that to do my programs and he was a very good presenter and he's now, in truth and in fact, Reverend V.B. Burke and Otis Wright is also a reverend Otis Wright with a church in Brooklyn so good comes from it. What other performers in the gospel film did you remember? I had um, Claude L. Clark who has been a great great success Otis Wright of course and a lot of other little ones there was a little a young man who came from Cleveland and he had a tremendous voice and he wanted to record. I did just one record with him. I think he was on contract here called Come to Jesus and it's really very lovely. He had such a strong voice but I think I'm the first person locally as a matter of fact I'm the first female producer in the Western Hemisphere and the first person to record gospel in this area. Well, you can see gospel is a big thing now and it is born out of what I had started.
you know, it's, I suggested it for a festival, um, Babsy Grange at the time, and she and I got together on it, and we had put on a gospel concert that nothing has topped yet. You know, we did very good productions there. I was a producer of those gospel concerts. But time marches on. <laughs> when you, you, you would be in the studio as a producer, you, mm -hmm. weren't, you obviously weren't one of these producers who would, you know, hire the musicians and then just disappear. No, no, I had to be there. there. I had to have my input. Um, <clears throat> how would you do that? How would you go up and talk to, say, some big drummer or some big ma male musician and get him to give you what you wanted, musically speaking? Well, there is a way to reach people. And um, if you are calm and your spirit is calm, you can always speak to the greatest man. We had a drummer named um, Malcolm. And he used to curse. He used to curse every second of the way. And I said, but I made sure I was very prompt with my payments to the musicians. I think I was the first person to pay musicians in an envelope. I was the first person to raise their, mu their fees from 30 shillings to two pounds. And so we went on and on. And I said, Malcolm, I'm not going to use you if you continue with these words on my session. I don't like it. And this session he came, he wanted to play and he came and he did the recording and he locked up his mouth according to me, he locked up his mouth and he went outside after and he cursed the bad words outside and so he comes back in and the last tune we were going to do, he just said, could we just have so and so on that tape and he cursed one. <laughs> And that was a lot of fun, although it wasn't something pleasant, but it was there as, you know, it's on the tape. <laughs> but um, you could always speak to them. And in those times, people were not as arrogant as they are now. People seem to be very arrogant these days. And even if you are calm, you know, it's, it's a little harder to reach them. But we could sit down and reason. And sometimes they come to the store and we rap for the improvement of the music, you see. So you had a shop at that time as well? Yes, I had a retail store and I had a factory that I produced. I manufactured and in 1975 I bought out Treasure Isle Studio, tapes, masters and from there I began working. I made the dub albums which I, before Dupree died because he died later and um, I did a good marketing on that and until the time I came out and I have now given my distribution through Sonic Sounds and Heartbeat in Boston. Um. <clears throat> yeah, that you agree. Mm -hmm. um, what was, perhaps you could describe what kind of person Duke Reed was for us, how you found him? I, I really didn't have too much to do with him per se. I had to buy his records for my store and when he became ill, we became more friendly at that time. I would visit him and we would talk and he expressed the desire of selling his his product and his material and so we negotiated and um, I purchased them and when I put the album out I said to him, the, the dub ones, I said to him what do you think of it? Uh, do you feel badly? And he said no Miss P it's your material now and you know and um, when, when he was so very ill, I went with him to the hospital in Miami and, you know, I was there for him and his wife because, you know, people need support at that time. Okay, um, I'm just going to ask about certain odd records which you may or may not remember. Um, one record I want to talk about, Musical Fight by the Crashers. 
which has the break-in bottles going in it. Okay. Um, you remember Linford Anderson? He was a wonderful engineer. Um, you talk about the crash up, but I'm going to talk about um, Dr. Nogo. That laughter in Dr. Nogo, that kitchen laughter is mine. <laughs> and we were just fooling around in the studio that day and, and Linford started making little sounds and so I was just there laughing with that kitchen laughter and he said, oh Miss B, keep it up, keep it up. And so we went through and came up with Dr. Nogo. Then we made a dub of it. And Winston Blake from Merito, I owe it to him because he lived on it and it became such a success, you know. So in studio, sometimes you try little things and it comes up. So actually those are bottles you hear breaking in the studio, you know, in that song. But we had a good time. And then in, in, we weren't so serious and so severe in those times when we were doing work in the studio. You know, everybody had a, a joyful spirit. It was more and, of a sense of yes, fun. Yes, yes, and so it comes out in the music. Today, the music, to me, I'm listening to some of them, and they sound so stereo. I, I hate to say this, but it seemed to be true, that um, the creativity is moving away from the music in such a drastic manner, because they have redone all the classics and they've not done them with improvement. And this, this is what has deteriorated things. Yeah, because everything you did was original. Yes, I mean, yes, copies yes, of yes. Existing we did like the whip with, with the Ethiopians and it just had a, a feel, you know. Everybody was just so happy, you know. Um, another record that I'm interested in Rebel Teacher by Errol Walker. Do you remember that one? I remember it and I remember Errol Walker, but I don't even know what to say about it at the moment. I would have had to refresh my memory before coming to you with this. Okay, okay. Um, Stormy Weather, Bobby Ellis. Yes, yes, that's another instrumental. Which is from the mid 70s. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, I mean, it's a great instrumental, many, many versions. Yes, been, been yes, done been done of it. it. It's just unfortunate that when you, you do something like that and um, it's being mutilated and there is no recompense from it and that sort of thing. And I think it's quite disheartening as a producer because you rarely go out there with some form of creativity won and your live money invested too, you know? But I guess it's, get, it's going to fall in place now. It will take a little couple of more years and I'm very happy that it's happening in my time. Okay. Um, perhaps anything you'd like to say? I'll, I'll, I'll more or less work through my questions. I would like to say I'm very happy that Island Record is taking this interest to document and um, put together something meaningful from the pioneers, which is history, and I'm happy to be a part of it. I enjoyed every moment that I spent as a producer. Um, and I'm happy for the artists I worked with, some more than some, but everybody had an input and I'm very happy for them. Some have come up very successful and some have faded away, but um, I have some classics which will be my footprints on the sand of time and I might not have as many as the men, but I have my input there and I'm very happy. Mrs. Pollinger, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. Is, um, I'm just wondering, what was the inspiration for Doug? Where did it come from? Doug. Yeah. Where did it come from? Okay. Doug. I 
think we set a precedence there in Jamaica because you know Jamaicans like a lot of rhythm. And so our engineers explored the idea of the echo chamber and sounds like that. It came really out of the dance hall and the sound systems. And so we found that the musicians, the producers of those times used to get together and do something for the dance hall and put it on dub and they would sell it for enormous sums of money. And so eventually the producers followed suit and, and they would do it for the flip side of a record, which if you did four tunes, you could have eight records, so to speak, you know? So I think that's where the dub originated from. Okay. That's, that, that's about it, I think. Yes. Right, the other thing, um, if you'd just like to introduce yourself to the camera. Okay. And perhaps if you say, you know, what, what you did or whatever, you know. Just go in your own words. Uh -huh. so yes. You do it to this camera here. Okay. And when you're in time. I'm Sonia Pottinger from Kingston, Jamaica. I used to be a record producer, one of the first women producers in the Western Hemisphere, and I am now retired. I do flowers and ceramics, which is still in the field of art, many other things in the craft. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for the establishment of the legal question as well, mm -hmm. which we can get, mm -hmm. you know, which is why I'm still Yes, yes. Can you unhook un me? Yeah, that's Can I get you? I don't quite remember his name if it was Ray or something like that. But he was from Barbados. And that's the award there, yeah. Yes, yes, mm. that's the Every Night Award. Great, great record. <laughs> <laughs> Go back one. Yeah. I'd be alright, yeah. Would you like some light there? You alright? Yeah. One of my kids firing now. This is lit. This kill is firing. But this one is, is being emptied. Something in it is to be emptied. And see, so we do the wheel, the potter's wheel. And that's my large kill over there. It's my new collection. And, um, mm. and, uh, go ahead and add all of you. Yes. You the, um, you, you're the potter. Yeah. Mold, 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 mold maker. Mold maker. Mold maker. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's right. What are you doing here? Cleaning, cleaning off the rides. Now I know why you're not making records. <laughs> I mean, this is something else. I can't remember. You see, forget too much trouble. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm sorry, I, you know I do mugs and paint them with Jamaican. For my mother, with a palm tree on yes, it? Jamaican. Yes, 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 but I've um, never bought quite a lot from me. These are what we put in the baskets. Yeah, the, the yam and the pineapple and the bananas and so on. Oh, and Aki down below Yes, there. yes. <laughs> so, you know, and so I have molded it and um, made it in this vase and um in pots no <laughs> there were bottles in the studio yeah. so tell me about the molds the molds yeah well the molds and things like that see how a bit of them need to set pour in 
20 minutes, take it out. And then take it around the front and then take out the seam and do like that. Down. For, uh, four day That's it. Uh, and then, if, and then feckle it, and then after the feckle it, now them, them fire it. After them fire it, them spray it, for spray it, them glaze it, put it back in the kill, and fire it again, and it come out glistening. Take away them time. We soon be having a busy time, and it's Mother's Day coming up, and these are orders to go out um, for Michael College. They buy these to decorate the school area, you know? So I assemble them. 